<laughs> Thanks, Jerry. You're, you're, you're actually too kind, and I mean that. You are too kind. It's, it's really good to be here, and I have to say it's been, a, um, it's been one of those things. You know what it's like in the week when you're thinking, right, I'm doing that thing. What's that thing I'm doing on Saturday? I'm doing that thing. Jeez, I have to do something on Saturday. I'm delighted I'm doing something this Saturday. I have to say I really, really, really enjoyed uh, this event so far. I think all of the speakers so far have been incredible, and it's been a real privilege to sit and listen to what you've said, and I'm really looking forward to what will follow from that. Uh, and, and I always expected to be inspired by the, by the chair of the Samaritans. I always expect to be challenged by the chair of the Samaritans, but who knew he was going to be that funny? <laughs> Uh, um, uh, it, it, it was wonderful. Um, I should just say, first of all, uh, what, what I want to try and do maybe a little bit is capture some of what Amnesty International's concerns are, I suppose in the area of LGBT rights generally, but then let's also maybe talk uh, and, and try and link the, the, the domestic and the international. Um, but also maybe talk about some of the challenges that uh, perhaps the LGBT community in Ireland, from, I think now, a place of very particular privilege, need to begin to take on board. And I, I think Pio has named some of them already. But I suppose the first thing is, is just, to, just to perhaps drill down a little bit into that concept of equality and what it means. Um, of course, equality matters. Uh, uh, in the human rights context and in the context of international human rights law, non-discrimination is a fundamental principle of that body of law. And, you know, when Mark uh, and myself and people like us talk about international human rights law, I, I don't know about you, Mark, but I often find um, that when I'm talking to governments, including our own government about this, I often get a look back as if to say, yeah, but that's not real, of course, is it? It's like you're talking about, you're talking about uh, uh, law that's not really law. Well, international human rights law wasn't written by Amnesty International or the ICCL or LEN or human rights activists or marriage equality or anybody else. It was written by states. And I think it's important that we remember, and I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm talking to a group that's a, a, that, is a, that are the members of the, the senior party in our current government. International human rights law is a body that was drafted and adopted by states. And it's not aspirational. We're not talking about something that we aspire to that maybe we get to in 10 or 20 or 30 years' time. By the way, most of it was written in the, the mid-1960s. The two big international treaties were agreed in the 1960s. Ireland signed up, for instance, to the, to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in 1989, uh, which is quite some time ago. These are minimum standards agreed by states that are meant to be uh, that are meant to place clear legal obligations on states. They are minimum standards. And non-discrimination is a guiding, founding principle in international human rights law. And I think that if we're serious about equality, we have to be champions for equality in its broadest possible sense. And we have to be champions uh, in the fight against discrimination as broadly as we can possibly make it. And, and you know, we also, I think, have to be, and I'm very encouraged by the, how the language of human rights has really taken huge purchase in Ireland. That so many people now advocate on issues from a human rights perspective, not because I think human rights, you know, is some kind of theological construct that we can all aspire to, but I think because human rights provides a valuable framework. It's not going to solve every, every problem, but it provides a valuable framework that allows us to explore what at times are, are, are very complex uh, issues. It's also interesting to know how the opponents of uh, things like equality, begin to use or analyse or, or frankly murder human rights concepts. And I mean, one of that we've seen, one example of that we've seen quite a bit recently. Do you know, if David Quinn, if I hear him again saying that it's not discriminatory to treat different situations differently, well, I won't scream because I expect I'd be screaming for a very long time if I did, but he, he, he and others who, who pronounce that miss the final uh, words that are necessary to complete that, that sentence. It is not discrimination to treat different situations differently, provided there's an objective reason for doing so. Provided there's an objective reason to do so. And as we see in the context of marriage equality, there is no objective reason to do, to do so. And the spurious grounds that are presented in relation to uh, um, parenting, etc., are, are simply a nonsense. You know, the argument against marriage equality in that sense likes to act as much of that uh, a body of thought in Ireland does as if the people who manifestly <coughs> challenge their position or their, their, their theocratic approach to ad ad addressing such issues simply simply don't exist. You think there weren't families in this country going back decades that were parented by same-sex couples. You would think that those children weren't going to school in Ireland every single day and quite frankly I'm delighted to report as a parent having a wonderful experience of growing up in Ireland in 2013 and earlier than 2013. We live thankfully in a very very different Ireland and I'm very proud uh, uh, to live in a society that understands difference uh, 
by recognizing commonality, by recognizing the simple humanity uh, of the other, of the situations that, that, that we live in. I have to say as well, uh, many thanks to Pascal. I was, I was really, really, um, I, I don't mean this in a patronizing way, but really, really delighted to hear what Pascal was saying about the need uh, that we have in Ireland at the moment to reflect on more than ourselves as an economy, or, or, or more than a need uh, um, uh, to focus politically even just beyond the narrow uh, economic crisis, the urgency of the economic crisis that we're in. But I think we also have to recognise <coughs> that it's different, difficult for government to do so at the moment, because actually it is a crisis. It is a massive, enormous political and economic crisis. And it's one of those moments, I think, where Irish civil society, and I don't mean organisations who form part of civil society, I mean people living in Ireland who have a voice and have a capacity to use it, and many of us have that, need to be part of the conversations now that, that, that seeks to address some of those issues. So as we emerge from, hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, please God, this particular crisis, what kind of Ireland do we intend to build? What are the differences? What are the, the changes that we will put in place to make sure that we actually are a more equal society? Because of course the reality is we're not. We're a profoundly unequal society in many ways. And that takes me back to that question of the privileged position that uh, LGBT, or at least, frankly, LGB people are in in Ireland at the moment. We understand something. We understand the experience of discrimination and of uh, uh, difference. We understand, uh, we understand the impact of exclusion. We understand the impact of being treated in law as if we are, as if our difference makes us less than fully human. I can remember when I came out in Dublin in, in about, well, back when God was a boy, quite a long time ago. You know, it was still at a time when the, the only gay club in Dublin was, was the NGF down behind the central bank, Flickers. Ross is throwing his eyes heavenwards. This, I'll try and look out as anybody else of a similar vintage doing the same thing out there. <coughs> But at that time, it was a common experience, if you, were, if you were in the club, for the guards to come in and just walk around the place. They'd just walk around the place. There was, a, there, was a, there was a sinister, threatening presence very often that reminded you that you were deviant, that the law did not approve and that your society did not approve. We've come a very, very long way, haven't we? But it's not so long ago since that was our reality. 30 years this year was the first ever Pride March. What? What was, the, what, you know, what was the, the impetus for the first Pride March? That horrific murder 30 years ago of a young gay man in Fairview Park who was beaten to death, had his genitals, genitals cut off and shoved down his throat. And when the crowd who, who murdered him were brought before the courts, they were acquitted on the basis that they were forced to kill him because he had come on to them in some form. The whole gay rage uh, uh, defence was used. And, and they were acquitted. And they marched in triumph afterwards. They held a victory march. And some very, very courageous individuals decided enough of that and held a pride march out to Fairview Park. That's 30 years ago this year. It's not that long. So we've made extraordinary inroads as a community. We've made extraordinary inroads as a society. And I think it's fair to say that in the main now, LGBT issue, and I'm going to keep saying LGB, and you'll know why, we've all spoken about this to some degree, are at this point now probably mainstream issues. They're, 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 they're well uh, uh, understood. It's been a long, hard battle. I don't underestimate at all what it's taken uh, for us to get, get to this point. But there's a, a pretty mainstream acceptance now of the importance of, of, of uh, the rights of lesbian, gay and bisexual people. Again, transgendered people are left still uh, 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 outside of uh, full inclusion in terms of that work towards equality. And, you know, just to reinforce some of what Pio said, the failure of many of us, including many of us within the gay, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community, to consider the lived reality of transgendered and intersex individuals in our society is something that we need to get to grips with. You know, and, and, and humanizing that, that, that struggle. And I would hope, by the way, humanizing that difficulty in a way that does not require transgendered and intersex individuals to have to expose themselves in the same way that many of the rest of us had to do so over the years would be a very welcome thing indeed. I think we owe it to others within our community and within our society to prepare to stand up and champion their rights in a way that we might have wished others would have championed ours. So, you know, uh, uh, I think particularly for transgendered intersex, intersex individuals, because their difference, their struggle, is so easily misunderstood, because it's so outside of the frame of reference of most people, we need to pose some of the questions.
as champions for their equality uh, um, uh, and address some of those issues and not, and not require that they do. So let's talk about some of the challenges that that community face. Let's talk about issues like forced divorce or forced sterilisation and some of the complications that that bring, br brings, uh, brings into people's lives. You know, how many people heard a couple of years ago of the pregnant man in America and kind of went, what kind of circus show was that? What's all that about? I know I had a little bit of that reaction and really had to check myself and think, well, what's all that about? The reality for very many transgender people is that in order to have recognition of their gender, they are forced to give up what many of us would uh, believe are very basic fundamental human rights. The right to marry the person that we love, or to remain in that marriage if we're already married, and the right to parent. And yet for many people in many jurisdictions right across Europe and beyond, in order to have one's gender legally recognised, one has to go through a surgical intervention that renders one sterile. Forced sterilisation is a requirement for transgendered people to have their gender recognised. Uh, uh, there's, there's gender recognition legislation being drafted or prepared at the moment here in Ireland. And for instance, it requires that uh, transgendered individuals who are married will have to be divorced in order to have their gender recognised. So much for respect and regard for marriage. You know, we're going to legislate now to require uh, certain individuals in Ireland to, un to, to divorce from the person they love, the person that they want to spend their lives with and, who and with whom they've entered into a legal marriage in Ireland to divorce in order to recognise their fundamental right to their identity and respect uh, uh, for their identity, including their gender identity. So those are some of the challenges that I think we as a, a community uh, need to get to grips with. Um, and, and I think one of the ways in which we do that, because we understand, I think, in many ways, what's necessary in order to get people to step beyond a kind of a myopic view of, of, of us as people who are, are perhaps different uh, uh, to others. You know, one of the big barriers to getting uh, um, straight society, I hate that phrase, but straight society to recognise our individual humanity has, to get them to, has been to get them to stop thinking about us having sex. Yeah. Hasn't it? Yeah. I remember my own father had that huge struggle. He struggled enormously with my, with my sexuality. And my sister once said to him, she's a wise woman, she said, Dad, when you think about Colin being gay, do you think about him having sex? And he went, yeah. And he looked really disturbed by it. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> And then she said, and when you think about me and my boyfriend, do you think about us having sex? She went, God, no. And she went, well, then why are you thinking about that with him? So we knew that one of the things that we had to do was to get people to lift themselves up out of the gutter and understand that they didn't have to, they didn't have, to have the same uh, uh, orientation as us to understand it. They just had to find a way to, 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 to see us as human, to, to understand our lived realities. And I think we know that. So in, in the drive for equality, whether it's for LGB people, or whether it's for LGBT people, or even actually, uh, as a political party, who's meant to be concerned, uh, and who I know are concerned with the greater good, with the idea or the very notion of equality, the thing we must do is drill down into and grapple with the human, the very human realities, the lived experience of those who suffer from discrimination, whoever they might be whether they be LGBTI people, whether they be Roma, whether they be members of the travel community, whoever they might be, we have to challenge ourselves to step beyond our narrow, myopic view of reality, because that's all we have. We underst only understand reality from our own experience and try and open ourselves to understanding the reality of the other in a way that gets us beyond those humps that restricts our ability to recognise uh, 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 um, the need for equality and to act to ensure that we respect equality fully. Um, in that context then, just a couple of things very quickly that I would suggest that as a, as a group you might consider, I'm watching the time as quickly as much as, there we go, that I, uh, that I, I think you might want to consider. Um, at the European level, for instance, I mean, Ireland still holds the presidency of the European Union. In some ways, we published our midterm review of the presidency in the last week. In some ways, it's been encouraging. Uh, Alan Shatter, for instance, has become an advocate for uh, uh, mechanisms now within the EU that will look to ensure that there's respect for human rights law 
once a state becomes a member state, because as many of us know right now, you know, if you're, our focus on accession, on, on the accession process means that we're very concerned about the human records of states who want to become members of the EU, but as soon as you're a member, actually we don't really care that much, we're not that interested in your, in your human rights record. So Europe is not good at applying or, or, or holding up a mirror to itself in the way that it holds up a lens to states that might want to become members. And the failure of the EU to guarantee accountability for violations carried out by member states is pretty extraordinary. Uh, I'd flag in that regard violations against the Roma community. We've seen over the last, I mean, there's, there's a, a six million Roma living in, in, in Europe. Do yourself a favour and, and do a little bit of research about the kind of discrimination that that community faced right across Europe. They are, they are the community that experience the most abject forms of discrimination right across Europe. That means that, quite frankly, we never get to talk about notions like equality for Roma in the workplace because they'll never get to the workplace. They can't access education, they can't access housing, they can't access health. They are wildly discriminated against. Uh, um, um, uh, and uh, we've seen, for instance, and one of the discourses that happens within the EU very often is, well, of course, you know, the newer states, we have to be careful that we're going to apply different standards to the older states, as if the older states are somehow champions of, uh, of equality. Well, on the Roma issue, the two states who need to face infringement proceedings taken by the EU happen to be France and Italy. France, which most recently carried out re repatriations of large Roma communities, and Italy, where mass forced evictions of Roma communities uh, is an ongoing problem. And yes, some of the newer states, like the Czech Republic, like Slovakia, like Romania and others, there are real discrimination issues there as well, but they also happen within Europe. Thankfully, Alan Shatter's concerned, not in a, in a focused way on the Roma issue, but on that question of fundamental rights protections within Europe, and that's something that we'd commend the current government on and your own Minister for, for Justice on, and we'd urge you to continue to support that. But also to push for the adoption of a robust anti-discrimination directive within Europe. It's something that's now been shelved for the last number of years. We'd hoped the Presidency, and indeed the Minister for Europe, European Affairs suggested that it was something that she'd hoped to see progress on during the Presidency. We haven't seen it yet. We need robust mechanisms, both in terms of protection, but then crucially, accountability for violations of those mechanisms within the EU if, if we're to see significant advances in equality and equality projections or protections. So those are some of the things within the EU level that I'd suggest you might look at. And then equally, the things that we care about here, we have to care about in other places. There must be coherence between what we say matters to us as individuals, of course, and how then we treat others. But then as a state, there must be coherence between the things that we say matter at the national level and at the international level. And we are in a place of particular privilege as members of the LGBT, even T community uh, here in Ireland. We know that levels of discrimination, oppression and hate crimes against LGBT people across the world becomes a mass, is, is a massive issue. Jerry was, uh, came into the uh, uh, Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs last week when we had uh, an amazing woman, some of you will have met her I know while she was here, Kasha Nabagresa, over from Uganda. Look at what's happening to LGBT people across Africa at the moment. By the way, under significant influence, not from traditional African uh, 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 belief structures or, or, or cultural approaches, but actually in particular uh, through, through overt manipulation and influence from evangelical Christian groups in the US and in other places, and also sadly the, the, the way in which the Catholic Church responds to a, a, um, advances in hate crime legislation or, or hate legislation, uh, gay hate legislation in Africa and other places. We have the same problems in Europe in Russia, in some of the Balkan states. There are significant LGBT rights issues at the international level that we have to lift our focus up from what's happening here nationally, continue to work and advocate for full equality here in Ireland. But let's also talk about how we can advance that notion uh, beyond Ireland as well. And then finally, because I really have gone over time, an LGBT group within Fine Gael is an incredibly valu valuable welcome thing on so many levels. Not least because we have to begin to talk about equality, not as some lefty liberal aspiration idea, but as a mainstream political concept that parties of all ilks and ideologies must sign up to and must respect. So I really congratulate you, congratulate you on making something very clear generally in Ireland, that equality is not a, 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 the unique property of any political ideology. Equality is a fundamental human rights principle. It's a fundamental principle of a just, free and democratic society, and one that political parties of all ideologies should champion. And I'd urge you, beyond the LGBT issue alone, to champion equality broadly within Fine Gael and within a Fine Gael-led government.
uh, um, that could be an enormous legacy, uh, not just for this group within Fine Gael, but for Fine Gael within government, not just on this occasion, but perhaps on future occasions as well. Thanks very much indeed.